Welcome. Uh, my name is Mohan. I am a PhD fellow here at Institute. I welcome you all on behalf of the PhD fellow community here and on behalf of the graduate school. We welcome you to this uh, second weekend debate. The first debate, uh, we had about 30 participants in a small room. I am really happy to see more people coming in. So I hope this grows. Today we have the wicket debate uh, on a day of two disciplines and uh, we have two eminent speakers, uh, Professor uh, Murugesh Sivapalan and Dr. Jessica. And we also have a very well-informed moderator, Anna Aslin. So she will be moderating the session. Uh, let me have a privilege of introducing the speakers and the moderator for this evening. Dr. Anna Aslin was educated at Wahil University in tropical land and water management. She gained extensive experience as hydrologist in UK and Africa. In a PhD thesis, she analyzed the roles of water expertise in water resources management. And she continued to research the process of, processes of scientific knowledge, production, policy formulation, and implementation in several research projects. She is now a postdoctoral doctoral fellow in Institute. Dr. Jessica Burks is a human geographer with an interdisciplinary background in environmental and development and regional specialism in Latin America. She holds the MA in Hispanic Studies from the University of Glasgow, an MS in environmental issues in Latin America from the University of London, and a DPhil in Geography from the University of Oxford. She is with the University of East Anglia since 2013. Professor Dr. Murayesh Sivapalan is a hydraulic engineer and an environmental hydrologist. His recent work has focused on modeling the core evolutionary dynamics of coupled human, water, and ecolo ecological systems. Dr. Sivapalan was the founding chair of the International Association of Hydrogeological Sciences, Decade on Predictions and Unleashed Basins Initiative. He has been a member of the editorial boards of several international journals and was executive editor of European Geosciences Union Hydrology and Earth System Sciences, probably known as S, journal for the last 10 years. Dr. Sivapalan is now with the University of Illinois. I welcome Anna to come and give a brief introduction about the topic of this evening. Thanks. Welcome everybody, it's great to see so many faces and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, moderate this discussion. Thank you very much for inviting me to moderate this discussion. Uh, now, we talk about a tale of two disciplines and I'll, I would like to introduce the two talks by explaining why we talk about two disciplines, why it's important that when you're listening, you keep in mind that these people do really very different kinds of research. However, the object of study, you could say, is the same, which is the mutual shaping of water and human systems. So, thank you for Peter for for these pictures. Uh, we all know that water systems are not natural anymore. Humans use the water system, we use this arrow by constructing dams, by constructing irrigation systems, etc. So we get a modified natural system, as indicated on the top, the flow regimes change, for example, the ecology changes, but also a modified social system. So it works two ways. Uh, there's electrification, which gives economic benefits, there's irrigation, growth, uh, but also negative impacts, for example, evictions in, to construct the dam. Some benefits and some don't. Now, to conceptualize the social nature, uh, society and nature relations, you could say there is a natural system, the blue one from hydrology, there's a social system, the green one on the, on the, the right, uh, and they overlap. But this is only one perspective. Uh, Jessica will. Uh, explain another perspective on this interaction of systems. Now, Fabius, thank you for this slide. Fabius, uh, please do it in our project. Ultimately, you could, you could argue that both types of research that we will hear about tonight 
uh, present a way to know water, which of course is what our model institute is about. Now, I think we all agree we don't know water anymore as just a hydrological, by just studying the hydrological cycle. To know water, we will have to take into account the human use of water. But there is yet another way of knowing water, which focuses on water as a political uh, um, substance and as an economic substance. So it studies different elements of society than the one on the left. Now, one piece of toolkit that will help you to understand, to interpret the two presentations that we'll hear is uh, the idea of research paradigm. When we talk about different types of research, when we talk about interdisciplinarity, we have a tendency of focusing on the methodology. We tend to look at what are you doing? Are you doing modeling? Are you doing quantitative work? Are you maybe doing some discourse analysis, text analysis? So we tend to focus on what you do, but we, we have to remember that what these two speakers do also has very fundamentally different foundations, which are called paradigms. And I will not be able to explain this in detail. I think most of you have received uh, the paper where I discuss and compare these two, so you'll be able to uh, have a better read um, later on if you haven't read it already. But what is important, I think, in this table is two terms ontology and epistemology. And ontology means your basic view of the world. And a very uh, simple one to explain this is to say, okay, the earth is flat, or the earth is a circle. They are examples of ontology. Another example of ontology is to say, humans are rational economic actors versus Humans are, take decisions on emotional, cultural, but also some economic grounds. So those are examples of ontology. It's your world view. It's how you see the world. It's basic assumptions. Then epistemology is another very important element of research paradigm. Epistemology answers the question, what can we know? And there's, there's a basic contradiction between the assumption that we can have objective truth or that all our knowledge is subjective and an interpretation of reality. Now the second one allows for different knowledge systems to coexist and to, uh, yeah, to um, uh, allow different interpretations of the world. So with, without any further ado, I'm really curious and interested to hear the presentations. Afterwards, I will ask both uh, um, speakers, so they first do their presentations, then we will come back to the stage, and I will ask both speakers to reflect very briefly on these two questions. The first one is, what is the scope for collaboration, or maybe even integration, between your two research approaches. And I have given an, an answer in my paper, but that's not necessarily what they agree with. Maybe you have other answers. Maybe you have questions around this. The second question is, how could a water manager, and I was keeping you in mind, use these different types of research when you go back home? So those two questions will be the questions to introduce the discussion. And please also, you are invited to reflect on this and to give your opinion. And the speakers have confirmed they're very interested to hear from you. So, thank you very much. And please, Jessica, it's your turn. I feel like 
I'm vertically challenged here in the Netherlands. <laughs> Standing on my tip toes. Thank you to Jonathan and our colleagues for inviting me um, here this afternoon to engage in this wicked debate. I've never before participated in a wicked debate. And the word wicked in English actually has at least three different meanings. Evil, complex, and great slang meaning. So let's see what kind of wicked debate um, we're going to have. So I'm going to present um, today the concept in broad, a broad outline of the concept of the hydrosocial cycle um, as I've been developing it um, in close collaboration with a colleague of mine, Jamie Linton, who's a professor at the um, University of Limoges in France. And the main objective of the, the presentation is to give an outline of the idea of the hydrosocial cycle, um, to explain what, what, what we believe it is, and what it does, and what it doesn't do. For the, I've structured the presentation into um, five um, parts, if you like. Um, outlining first where the concept comes from, um, obviously linked in some way to the hydro hydrological cycle. Talking then about how social scientists have addressed the relationship between humans and water um, over the years and how the hydro so our concept of the hydrosocial cycle emerges from that. Then I'll talk a bit more specifically about how we understand and are framing the hydrosocial cycle and then how it can be used as an analytical framework, where it directs um, attention. And then I'll finish with um, some final remarks. So this is um, a paper by the second speaker, our esteemed professor. And what I just want to highlight here is that it's exactly the relationship between people and water that the hydrosocial cycle um, develops and it's the nature of the relationship between those um, components and I think that's where the main difference is, is going to lie as I think also Anna um, hinted in her presentation just now. Another version um, of the hydrological cycle obviously a very simple one um, showing the hydrological processes that operate in um, any given place in the world and leading to our conception of the hydrosocial cycle. So this comes out of um, social scientists perceived limitations of the hydrological cycle. Firstly, as Anna has already mentioned, that um, it extracts physical processes from the social context. It tries to study hydrological processes as if that environment were not influenced by humans, something that obviously socio-hydrology now responds to. Um, other critiques of the hydrological cycle are the fact that it's a universal model for any place in the world, even though many um, environments in the world are not reflected very well by the hydrological cycle including, for example, very cold environments, very wet or seasonal environments, um, very dry environments. And drawing on Jamie Linton's work, the hydrological cycle has, has a history. It came out of somewhere. It came out of you know, a set of people in a, in a time in history. Um, and just to summarise very quickly, um, Jamie Linton argues that the hydrological cycle is not necessarily a paradigm for understanding water flows in the environment itself, but it was also instrumental in allowing hydrology to separate from earth sciences and form a separate science um, in the 1930s USA. And while you might think that that, that history is irrelevant, the hydrological cycle, by focusing solely on physical processes, privileges, because there are no people there, privileges um, technical expertise over water from um, hydrological scientists and engineers in particular. So since 
the 1980s um, or, or something, water studies, debates, policies have moved a lot more um, in the social direction where we emphasise less um, technical expertise, infrastructure around water, and the ways that water decisions about water are, ma are made. Um, so from water management to water governance. And we now recognise more fully, as Anna has already said, the influence of, the, of humans on water processes, water cycles, even in the remotest parts of the world where pollution, for example, can be detected. And moving away also from a previous key paradigm of integrated water resources management that sought to coordinate uses and users better um, to this idea of governance and that everybody has a role to play in making decisions about water and how it's, how it's allocated between different users. So in um, our work, we argue that the hydrological cycle is no longer sufficient as the key paradigm behind water in this new era um, that privileges water governance. And so we need a new concept that explains how water works. And that, we argue, is more the hydrosocial cycle. So the hydrosocial cycle, as I said with the, the title of, of the professor's paper, it's about rethinking society's relationship with water and moving away from the idea that there are simply links between people and water um, to the idea that water itself is constructed and produced um, socially. So Jamie Linton has um, offered the concept of modern water, whereby he argues that H2O, the fact that water is H2O, is a modern construction, and that H2O is a label for many different things that are all labelled as water because they can be reduced to their chemical components. So water is actually a resource that's very diverse in its forms and it's the types of relations that it has with humans that go far beyond it being H2O, including its cultural <coughs> significance um, for many social groups. So we're questioning the way that water is constructed as solely H2O and the way that water is produced. So water is not just given, it doesn't just exist in the environment, it is made through human processes. And as such, it internalizes politics in its very nature. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the way that social scientists have approached the relationship between water and society. Um, in order to you know, explain the foundations of the hydrosocial cycle. Um, so Carl Wittfogel was one of the first to come up with um, a dialectical notion, notion of water, whereby he recognised that the way in which humans managed or manipulated water also had knock-on effects on how society was constituted, um, primarily through his study of large-scale water infrastructure in the American West and how that permitted large-scale um, irrigation, which in turn consolidated the power of bureaucrats and investors. So he recognises that two-way relationship between people and water. People manipulate water, but water also in turn allows a different society to emerge. But he kept those two <coughs> elements, people and water, distinct. There were two elements that interacted with and changed each other, but they were two separate things still. Then with um, the political ecology tradition and um, notions of hybrid nature and Eric Swingerdow's work in particular, we start to see water itself described as a hybrid nature. And I've got here a quote from one of Swingerdow's papers where he talks about um, water in a cup. So he says, if I were to capture some water in a cup, 
like a drinking cup, and excavate the networks that brought it there, I would pass with continuity from the local to the global, from the human to the non-human, quoting Latour. These flows would narrate many interrelated tales or stories of social groups and classes and the powerful socio-ecological processes that produce social spaces of privilege and exclusion, of participation and marginality, chemical, physical and biological reactions and transformations, the global hydrological cycle and global warming, capital machinations and strategies and knowledges of dam builders, urban land developers and engineers, the passage from river to urban reservoir and the geopolitical struggles between regions and nations. So what Swingedow is essentially saying here that these processes are all embodied in the drinking water that any one of us might capture in our cup or glass. So the water in that cup is not simply a substance of H2O, that water comes from somewhere, it's produced through these processes. It embodies these that aren't seen from the pure material substance um, in the cup. So what Swingerdow is doing there, which is different from Victor <coughs> is that he is um, positing water as something that's internally related, where the, the social process is embodied within the outcome of water in a cup, rather than two separate spheres of society and water um, interacting with each other. And the other thing that he does via this um, view of things is to emphasise the processes that are behind water over the form of water itself, over the product of the substance that we see and that we can quite easily take as very unproblematic water. So the hydrosocial cycle as we, um, myself and Linton, um, put it forward, builds on these two approaches, in particular Swingerdow's approach, and integrates um, relationality and materiality um, into, into that. So we build on um, Bitvogel by recognising that social relations always shape water, what, whatever water that is, whether it's drinking water or dam water or river basin that's been engineered, etc. And in turn, um, the social relations are shaped or reshaped by water. And we take the materiality um, argument by seeing water as a lively resource that also plays a role um, in its management and its social relations um, through its physical form as a flowing resource, for example, that's often um, not easily bounded and also a resource that's very meaningful and culturally significant to different um, groups. And there's been quite a lot of work around the ways in which water flows and tides and things like that shape um, social relations. And then we also um, bring in a relational dimension by especially positing that water is not the same thing. So anyone who speaks Spanish will know that water is typically rendered as aguas, in the plural, not the singular. And that's um, what, what we're getting at. When we talk about water, we're talking about waters, we're talking about different things. And different things with which relations are different um, as well. Um, and the different experiences that different types of water provoke. So we've already seen this, um, no, it's fine. It's um, very ubiquitous um, nowadays, and, and we have it in the paper as well. We even contacted um, Kate Ely to ask to, to reproduce it, which she kindly agreed to. So this is often um, represented as the hydrosocial cycle, because obviously, as you can see, um, you have the hydrological processes, and they are um, influenced by social processes, most notably the water flowing not downstream but upstream um, towards money to be used for commercial agriculture um, or whatever. 
So this picture is, is more like it. It's more in the direction of, of the hydrosocial cycle. Um, but it shows a bit more how humans manipulate water and manipulate um, those hydro, you know, the hydrological cycle, but very much less on what the effects of that are on social relations, on access, on cultural meanings, on people's identity. So we have to still go beyond um, that kind of representation. So as you can see through that diagram, it represents some of those political and economic factors. The diagram itself was um, a diagram that Kate drew following discussions with a North American um, First Nation tribe about the pressures that they felt on their, water, on their water resources being part of an indigenous reservation, whereby they could control the area within the reservation, but not that outside. Um, but it focuses very much on the physical flows, um, again, and how people manipulate those flows, but not on how those flows change them as a society and um, their identity. So we define the hydrosocial cycle as a process through which water and society make and remake each other over space and time. So there's a historical and a geographical dimension there. So the idea is that people make water in its different forms and that made water then shapes society in, in different ways, politics, discourses, identities. And again, that society that, that thus shaped by water then reacts to water in a different way in, sort of in a spiral type formation. Um, so water is produced by society and it produces a society and so it goes on, but not, never returning to the same water and the same society. We had a lot of debate at the time whether to retain the um, term cycle in the hydrosocial cycle because, as I said, we're not returning to the same things in a, in a constant um, process of going around. We're making and remaking and then remaking again. And so cycle for us is not circulation, um, neither circulation through the material environment nor society, but this constant process of making and remaking. So one of the things that we want to do by the hydrosocial cycle is see power, because this is a political ecology approach, not necessarily um, you know, a, uh, a neutral water approach. We want to understand the relationship between water and power, but very much understanding that power as within the water, as embedded within the water, as in the example um, from Swingerdow, and not just power around water as an external substance for, um, from society or over water. So the power is very much embedded within the water, not simply around it. And this process of production of water, seeing water is always produced, always the outcome of social relations, um, is, is necessary to, to be able to do that. And also, as, as I said before, the way that water itself has an agency plays a role in that relationship. It's not an inert substance. So as an analytical framework, there are four key things that, from a political ecology approach, the hydrosocial cycle is useful um, for doing. So the first one relates to the ontology that Anna mentioned what is water and that's one of the key things that we're questioning here we're questioning the nature of water from a material substance that's homogenized as h2o um, a water that exists in the same form everywhere but rather something that always has that story behind it as in um, swing those water in a cup recognizing the heterogeneity of water that Everything that we call water, even though that's what we've done for all our lives, unless we're a Spanish speaker. 
um, recognise that water encompasses a wide range of different things. Um, and a good example of this is desalinated water. Um, so for some of the masters and PhD students um, among you, I've put um, some references just so you could have a look if you were interested. So desalinated water is the ultimate produced water because it's completely made or manufactured by, by humans. Um, taken from the sea, reversing the, the classic hydrological cycle, and taking out the salt and making water um, for human, usually human consumption. And aside from lots of the issues with that process of high energy use, contamination of marine environments, that water produces different relations. So I'm currently working with a colleague in northern Chile where desalinated water is being introduced as part of the water supply and people don't want that as their water supply. They don't consider it as, as the same water. Um, and in McDonald's paper that I've referenced here, she talks about how the abundance of water in the environment that's produced by desalination in the context of the United Arab Emirates is changing the culture of water in that country where people are used to very scarce water, managing scarce water, and now suddenly through desalination water has become abundant and is changing that relationship um, in, that, in that particular context. The second um, point is thinking about the epistemological dimension that Anna mentioned is thinking about how water is known and studied and measured and represented. And questioning some of the hydrological concepts, methods and data that are, are taken for granted. And I've just included one example here of the concept of the watershed um, through a nice paper by Alice Cohen and Shauna Davidson um, where they look at what actually a watershed is and they conclude something like it can be you know, the size of a country or the size of a puddle on the sidewalk. So it's any, any space in, into which water drains. And they um, interrogate how that concept is used in policy um, and to what effect. Um, the third um, point is really what um, the concept of the hydrosocial uh, hydro cycle is set up to do. It's set up to reveal the power, relations and politics that are embedded within water and not simply around water, not simply water politics, um, but the way in which water is produced in such a way that embeds um, power and political processes. Um, so we're always looking at that process of production, where water comes from, how it's made, how it's framed, and what the implications of that process are. And um, recognising that there are many different realities in water, that water is not the same thing to, to, to all people. Um, and a good example of that is a paper in the special issue in which um, the Hydrosocial Cycle paper appears by Gabrielle Boulot where she talks about um, different ways of conceiving of major river basins in France um, according to the interests of the various scientists who led um, those processes. Um, so one set of scientists, for example, was very interested in um, um, freshwater crustaceans and they looked because of the life cycle of the, and the habitat of the crustaceans that led them to define the, the river basin in a different way to the other set of scientists who I believe were looking at microorganisms. So these concepts are not necessarily pragmatic, they have their history, they come from somewhere, um, from particular actors thinking in particular ways in particular historical and geographical contexts. And <coughs> lastly, and also quite importantly, um, the hydrosocial cycle encourages you to look beyond the water itself and to appreciate the bigger picture and the role of power um, in the wider agendas that accompany water. So we're very 
used to looking at the role of politics in water, but there's also a role of politics, uh, of water in politics as well. And trying to avoid self-indulgence, self -indulgence, an example is from my own work on Chile, on their famous <coughs> water market system, a unique water market system, and the reform, the attempted reform of that system, whereby the discussion about the reform of the system was not really about how to manage water, but it was all about preserving the neoliberal programme of which the water, the water model forms part. So looking at those power relations, that process of production, you see a bigger picture that you might not otherwise notice. Um, so the last slide, I'm trying to sum up, you know, what what the hydrosocial cycle is trying to do and what it's not trying to do. So we're trying to move beyond this idea of interactions between discrete humans and discrete water to hydrosocial relations, whereby the relations are in the water as well as beyond the water. So it's not about coupling or integrating um, hydrological systems and social systems for us or about integrating social factors into hydrology, even though I think that's a, a worthy and necessary endeavour. But it's looking at how water is produced by social relations and how in turn water produces those social relations in new ways. Um, and how those arrangements are constantly shifting and that's where you start to notice um, these bigger pictures. So it's not a framework for um, water and society studies per se, it's more a framework for undertaking critical political ecologies of water. So always reflecting on how water is constructed and how it's produced, how it's known, um, how it embeds power and reflects that power through the form that it takes. And what's the bigger picture beyond the water itself? And the reason for doing this, um, as part of critical political ecologies of water, is to try to inspire, try to pick up on those power relations in order to inspire change, contest um, those power relations that produce exclusion. And this is within a, a broader motive of the political ecology tradition to avoid sort of problem-solving approaches that don't necessarily tackle the underlying causes of issues such as exclusion from drinking water. Um, it allows you to challenge, not necessarily effectively, but at least try to challenge discourses and try to promote change at a more profound level. And just lastly, um, for example, I'm working with some colleagues at the moment on the concept of water security and trying to move this towards a much more relational approach um, to water security that moves away from securing the quantity of water for the people to shifting the hydrosocial relations that underlie that exclusion in the first place. That's all, thank you. Pleasure for me to come to IG. When I see the audience like this, I, I get a lot of pleasure. So, thank you for inviting me to this um, interesting debate. Can you hear me okay? I mean, I mean this is some kind of an echo. Um, okay, I, I want to start by um, presenting this quote because I, I, I anticipated. <laughs> the presentation by, by Jessica and I, I, will, I know what you'll be thinking um, because we come from very different perspectives 
And sometimes we don't know something because we don't know how to even say it. And uh, you know, so the language is a major, major issue. So we are coming from very different perspectives. Okay, some of the words that uh, I heard in Jessica's talk, I don't have any understanding of the their meanings. So I'm really far off. So I think that's where we are in, the, in this debate. And so we call it call it the debate between myself and Jessica. But really, it's going to be a debate in each one of you, in your own minds. The debate is going to be in you because I don't think that I can debate sufficient enough here with, the, with my lack of knowledge and understanding of the opposite field that actually I can enlighten you. I can only present what I know in my own language and I know that from, from my knowledge of IET, many of you are working in the middle and, and therefore you will be able to help us debate this better than we can debate ourselves. So I'm, I'm hoping that at the end of the presentations that there will be questions and discussion that, uh, that will help the debate move along. Okay, so I, I need to give you a little bit of history. So my involvement in this uh, started about 2010. Before 2010, I was, you can call me, pretty rigorous physical hydrologist. Um, it's only after I moved to the US, you mentioned, you heard that I, I worked on the public initiative, Richard's Sunday based initiative. That was over, and then I was, saying, I was thinking, what should I be doing in the future? And I moved to the United States and, and figured that, um, you know, we need to deal with people. People are everywhere. We need to deal with people. And, and so I organized uh, a series of meetings and discussions, and the first outcome of that was this paper. But I, it, was, it appeared in Water Resources Research, and I should tell you a story. Water Resources Research, in many people's minds, is the premier journal in hydrology. It started in 1965. When it started in 1965, the founders of the journal were so wise. They had the idea that there were, they were going to be two editors. One from the social sciences, one from the natural sciences. So Walter Leinwein was a physical hydrologist, and Alan Meese was an economist. They were the two joint editors when they started. The first paper that ever appeared in the journal was by uh, Ken Arrow, Nobel winning, Nobel Prize winning economist. The first paper ever appeared in the journal. But hydrology in the wisdom in the 1990s decided involving social scientists was, was detrimental to the science. <laughs> and they made a decision to remove that initial practice. Social science were removed and they haven't been back since. So uh, what we are trying to do is to bring the humans back into the hydrology cycle, hydrology. That's one history I want to tell you. Um, I'm actually writing a textbook right now on hydrology. One of the first things that we removed from the book was the hydrology cycle. We don't present the hydrology cycle anymore. Because all of you have done, if you have done a hydrology class, the first lecture is the hydrology cycle. <laughs> it's just presented as a motherhood statement Never come, we never come back to it. It's never used. It's just, it's just presented as if it's the it's holy grail of hydrology, but it's never used. So we decided to remove it. Um, so, so part of this paper is this picture. So I was in this nice forested land. All the work that I had done in my life was in nice, pristine environments. Looking at what happens to the hydrology, what happens to rainfall when it falls on the ground. And you know, on the right hand side, this is what the humans are doing. This is from the Millennium Report. So there's a long table in this paper. We try to contrast the old hydrology to what should be the new hydrology. And I just picked only two items. The old hydrology is where hydrology, uh, humans are external to the hydrology system. And, uh, and then what the way that we do research and study systems is to observe and analyze pristine places and then finally extrapolate to make predictions with, with human involved. That's the traditional view. The new view that we are trying to propagate in this paper that humans are intrinsic to the, intrinsic, intrinsic to the system 
both as agents of change and as beneficiaries of the services the system provides. And then the approach to studying hydrology is to observe and analyze real places where real people live and interact with the hydrology system at a range of scales. So that, I just want to contrast between the two of them. And between this paper and social hydrology, we had a whole series of further discussions in the community. And we came up with this, um, we came up with a white paper in 2011. And part of the recommendation of the white paper is actually that there is a need for a new field of social, called social hydrology to bring the human back into the hydrology system. Uh, and, and you heard already that we, we looked at it as a system where uh, the interdisciplinary field studying the dynamic two-way, we always emphasize the two-way interactions and feedback between, the, between water and people. That's social hydrology. Anything less is not social hydrology. Now, I, this is a mathematical statement, but I, I, I just presented it because um, the idea of coevolution that um, you, this can apply to traditional hydrology. You have the hydrology, hydrological processes operating in many different time scales, but you can think of it as an ecological system. You can think of trees. They have their own inter dynamics and they can interact and feedback on each other. And so what you see when you go out and observe in a river basin, a river flow, we always, hydrologists used to think of this as a physical system. Rain falls, a runoff, runoff happens. What is the relationship between rainfall and runoff? But really, actually, it's not the case. It's really an uh, emergent outcome of, at the, at the very least, two different dynamical systems operating at many different time scales, time scales interacting together. So river flow that you see is not the physical outcome of what happened to rain, what happened to rainfall, it's really a two-way feedback between the hydrology and ecology at the very least. Now you can extend that now that we have put people in there to be, uh, as an interactive feedback, feedback between the hydrological system or hydroecological system and the social system. So social processes operating in very different time scales, hydrological or natural processes operating in very different time scales, interacting together, creating emergent patterns. Imagine a meandering river. The meandering river on the left hand side. The meandering river is a revolution. It is revolution. <coughs> Nobody knows why the rivers meander. So that itself is a revolution process. Now you have on the right hand side two things systems co evolving together, interacting and providing an emergent outcome. Runoff, for example, as an example, is an outcome, emergent outcome. That's what I'm going to point out. So, um, in in social hydrology, when you when you're dealing with coevolution, a couple of coevolutionary systems, they lead to emergent, emergent outcomes, emergent phenomena. So social hydrology as a science, the subject matter of the science, is the phenomena that arise, emerge out of these couple of systems. Emergent phenomena. So when we do science, we go out, we, we first recognize phenomena, and then we ask the question, how did they come about? On the basis of discovering how they came about, you, you build knowledge, understanding, and hopefully contribute to your th a theory of the science. That is what happens. So, the, so if you see, in the last five years, we have been only in operation in five years, what we have been doing is looking at phenomena that arise in the real world. So here, here is an example of water management in agriculture system. So you have demand, people need water for agriculture, is a supply from nature, so you use the supply to satisfy the demand, but obviously that is, not the, that is not as easy as it is. So you need an infrastructure, you need a well or you need a pump, you need infrastructure, you need also governance. So when you put all of these things together, there is part human, part natural, they are interacting together, they produce an emergent phenomena. What is an emergent phenomena? Emergent phenomena. If you have a lot of water projects, water management projects all over the world happening as you speak. Some of them are successful, some of them are failures. Some of them are successful for a while and then become failures later. So success and failures come all the time. It's a dynamics behind it itself. So that is a phenomenon. When, when you do something and it fails for, because you didn't anticipate, that's, that's a failure. That's a phenomenon. When there are unintended consequences, 
or something that you did. You did something for this purpose, what you get some, is something else. Okay, you, you create, you solve a problem here, you create a new problem. That's an unintended consequence. That's a phenomenon. How did that happen? Is it because there's not enough water, or not enough demand, or is it because of something else? On the infrastructure side, on the, on the government side, contributed to it, that you did not anticipate. So I'm going to give you examples of phenomena that we have been studying in the last few years. I mean, I'm not going to claim that we have, we have 50 years of research under our wings to say that we have a new science, but we are just starting and share these are some examples, just to illustrate how this thing works. So, I just started with this example of the Kissimmee River in Florida. Those of you who are known to Orlando, yeah. Disney World, you know this river. I see two, two, two pictures here. There's a meandering river and there's straight, you know, this white, white shape here. Well, actually what happened was 1950s, 40s, they decided to, there was, it was already a meandering river. They straightened it because they wanted to re re reduce flooding that cost them, cost them billions of dollars, I think a billion dollars. But 50 years later, they re meandered Another billion dollars. Okay? This is what happened in the last few years. Because 50 years ago, they wanted to save them from flooding, save our themselves from flooding. 50 years later, rich people moved into the Orlando area. They did not care about flooding. They wanted a nice environment back. They were more powerful. You told about power dynamics. The people in Orlando are more powerful than the people in the, uh, the, the rural areas of the river basin. They were more powerful, they were able to impose their will, and this happened. So, one mistake for a panel mistake in 50 years time, that's an unintended that's <coughs> consequence, that's an emergent phenomena, and we actually published a, a, a whole winning paper on this. We model it. Another example, only two examples I'll present, is the the one I got introduced to first time is the Murray Darling River Basin. We have 100 years of history of agricultural development. And uh, cutting the story short, you know, we actually experienced, they experienced a, what we call a pendulum swing. So something was happening and it's, it came <coughs> from that. That was happening in time and also in space. So, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because there's a lot of theory and, and, and equations behind it, but you know, Water use kept on going up because people were extracting water from the river, using it to irrigate, extracting land, produce output. They kept on doing it. They were doing it so well that they were not realizing the system was so, you know, stuck into that mode of extracting more, extracting more water, and extracting more land, and kept on going. Eventually, the water ran out. There was no water flowing down to down to the Southern Ocean. Environment suffered. And then community kick back, then no, that can't be right. And they impose their will, the community as a group impose their will to turn it back. Okay? So that was an example of a pendulum swing, and I only presented this picture here just to tell you that as a hydrologist for time, moving into this, we model the system, the dynamics. There are five equations here, five differential equations that are puzzled. The main point I want to say here is out of the five equations, there's only one hydrology equation. So in order to understand the system, why it happened, you need more than hydrology. Okay? You need demography, you need ecology, you need social science, something social. So we actually modeled the social aspect, the, so, the state variable called environmental awareness. In other words, this is what people in the community feel about the environment, how much they value it, to the point that they actually force the system to turn around. But that's a social variable, we model by an equation. I don't know how many social scientists will accept that, but that's the way that we do our business. So, okay, hydrologists, but I think, I think at the very least, I admit to you that I, I, you know, I accept that hydrology doesn't solve all the problems. We need more than hydrology to really understand what happens in the world. So, this is at the diary, I don't know how much time here. So, um, this is how it works. So you have water being extracted more and more on the first picture A. As, it, as you take water out, the environmental flow decreases. More, less and less water flows down, downstream. That means the impact on the environment in, the, in, the, in terms of the wetlands, so the billabongs as you call them in Australia, they dry out. And then that drying out of the environment begins to be felt in the community in the, in the form of this environmental awareness. 
When that kicks up, that causes the system, the political system, the government system to turn this down. So they make decisions. I don't want to go into the detail, but that's exactly what happened turn around. So we um, looked at this from the point of view of a positive force, productive force, and a, and a restorative force acting against each other like the yin and the yang. And um, that mediated this positive and the negative is mediated by people because we, we are the ones who have to do all these things. We decide what we want, so that was mediated by this environmental awareness, the social variable. So, so remember we started with two-way feedbacks, water and people. At the time when we started it, I did not know the word values and norms. And I'm not a social scientist. I'm a pure hydrologist and engineer. I was learning along the way. And people told me, social scientists, that I was working with, yeah, these values and norms that normally underpin what people do and what is normally accepted, uh, sorry, used in, in management decisions, like in water resource management. They accept, they assume that these values and norms that you have about everything are fixed. Yeah, if you're a Chinese, you, this is what you need, you know, but you think of water or environment, it's fixed. Australians are different, but fixed. But what we learn is that those values and norms are themselves changeable. They change with people's lived experiences. So as you do something, to do something, to gain something, you, you gain an another unintended consequence that begins to be fed into the community, it changes the values, and that changes what you do. So it goes round and round. That introduces social perspectives directly in the form of values and norms. This is how far we have come so far in, in, in social technology. That doesn't mean that that's where we stop, but we are learning. Because most of the work that's been done here, unfortunately, is done by natural scientists claiming to be, claiming to be social scientists. <laughs> so, um, after doing this, actually, I was really pleasantly surprised, was, uh, pleasantly uh, surprised, yeah, that there was a paper that appeared in PLAS just two years ago, but now by a colleague who is the author of this, they said exactly the same thing, that culture has to be endogenized. Values and norms, yeah, yeah, must be endogenized in the system <coughs> of study. So, we have now absorbed that into our line of thinking. So that is all I want to say. So you you, are, you got from me a, a history of where we started from and uh, where we are now. And I just want to give you a perspective because most of the work, you know, this is only five years, and most of the work is done by a small group of people. And uh, so you can always expect same kind of products. But I was, I'm pleasantly surprised now. We have a special issue in water resources research. Water, same water resource research. We have a special issue now running. It's almost finished now. You won't believe this, but when we made a call last year, we were expecting about 10, 10 papers. 90 papers have been submitted. 9 0. And WRR has a rejection rate of 70%. So quite a few papers have been rejected. But we are happy we are, we are, that there will be about 40 papers left over left behind that they'll be published. And I looked at the titles of the papers that have been submitted. They are from wide group of people. So the field is actually broadening. It's not me who is actually running this. There's a wide group of people, including many, many social scientists. So the field is actually moving into an area. There's a lot of opportunities. So people in the audience, <coughs> you're running into a problem and you're, you know, complex problem, big tech problem. Social technology is a piece of pain because there's a lot to learn. So this is the kind of titles. Lot, lot more. Yeah, 90 papers, I only copied copy 30. So, <laughs> so there's, the field is actually becoming more and more healthy, especially in, in terms of a uh, you know, wide range of ideas and, and mm -hmm. models and data. So I feel very, very happy, but there's a long, long way to go. So this is just a summary. So in the, in the five years that we've been around, um, at least quantitatively, we have made a lot of progress. Um, there's a there's a there's a IHS initiative called the Panther Ride. We started after pub. Social knowledge plays a big role. So it helps us to propagate this thing around the world. And I think that I myself have published a lot of papers just to push the field. So I'm almost like a traveling salesman. 
<laughs> missionary. Um, so, so if you want to know more about it, there are tons of papers that are published. So we just we are we are very busy. We have been very busy pushing, pushing. We are very big into the field. So I will stop there and and uh, look forward to the discussions. I guess uh, Anna is going to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you both very much. Uh, for me, there was actually more overlap in the languages and the interests than I was anticipating, which is really interesting. So maybe there's quite a lot of scope for collaboration and exchange after all. Now, very briefly, in, in the paper that we published, we identified a few strengths and weaknesses, and I think they, they came up also in the presentations. So the strength of how the social research lies in developing a rich understanding or a narrative of the situation. Uh, social hydrology strength lies in formalizing a conceptual understanding of the situation. But they both want to take similar things into account. They just do it in very different ways as well as understanding water in a different way. So what we propose in our paper is that actually sequencing would be a really good idea. The strength of the hydrosocial research lies in this very rich understanding and then the social hydrologists can run with that understanding to do their modeling. But the problem with this is that inevitably, which you also touched upon, when you put th capture things in mathematical equations, the, 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 some of the, the richness of the situation, the plurality of the understandings, the plurality of the values and norms are lost. Because what is a failure of a project? Who says it's a failure? Maybe it's a success, success for some people and a failure from others. And if you start modeling, that richness is lost. So it's very difficult to take account of human agency, human decision making, chance and path dependency in monitoring. So that's as a very brief uh, summary of what I, uh, I think we heard. So then I would like to ask uh, the two presenters to briefly reflect on okay. these two questions. Do you think you can productively collaborate or exchange or even integrate ideas and what do you think the water managers of the future need to take home? Mm -hmm. You want to go Okay. Yeah, you want? Oh, sit here? Okay. Okay, maybe I don't have to stand up. The microphone is on, so you can yeah. just leave it here, that's fine. Yeah, scope for... Uh, Collaboration and integration. Yeah, I think that, um, um, as you heard already, the, the gulf between the two presentations is very vast. Um, so, um, so to, to bridge that, that gulf, there has to be a lot of effort. Um, because you have to cross a lot of um, obstacles, from, even from our own disciplines. Um, because, as I already mentioned to you, we went through this once and WRR kicked out the social scientists because it's devalued, down, what's the word they used? It's, um, yeah, uh, that the science is being, um, yeah, I don't know the word exactly, but eventually my community will not like me if I uh, don't have a lot of mathematics in, in, the, in the model, in the, in the paper that I present, it's like, oh, Siva is going soft. <laughs> you know? What's yeah. wrong with that? No, no, <laughs> nothing wrong with that, but I'm saying that we have our own barriers, we, you know, in our own <coughs> fields, that, you know, we have to, who, who judges our work? Our community has to judge our work. You know, I'm a scientist, I, 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 I declare that, I'm a scientist, I, my, my evaluation comes from my fellow scientists and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to be, come here and present this because I'm old enough 
that I don't depend on somebody's money, money and, and, and uh, uh, you know, approval. Mm -hmm. But I would not, you would have a hard time getting a younger hydrologist to come and give this presentation. Because they, uh, you know, so, so there are a lot of barriers. Number one, that's, that's disciplinary barriers. The other is a communication barrier that, that we, had, we need to cross. So, you know, you know um, what do we mean by, you said, values? What, what is that thing? Because I cannot just write a paper and do something, some science research, by saying values and do nothing about it. So I have to bring it in somehow as, as a quantity that I model and so on. So, so there are a lot of challenges like that. And, uh, and um, so um, I have done also a lot of collaboration with eco-hydrologists because I've, I've been an eco-hydrologist for a while. So I think that um, to move forward, um, we need people both sides willing to work together, accept differences, respect each other, because without respect, without respect, nothing will move. So, um, and uh, help each other, help, because, and I've had, I've been very fortunate with social scientists who would give me ideas like values and norms. Um, <laughs> And you know, feelingly, and said, "This is the way to go. If you do it, you you will make progress." And so, um, and 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 don't criticize me for doing making a mistake, because people can easily say, "You know, this is nonsense." In fact, I was accused. I'm, on the one hand, I'm being accused my own community of selling out. And I went to I went I gave a talk in, in Bologna, uh, 2014 on social ideology and a social scientist from South Africa stood up and uh, accused me of being a dilettante, <laughs> that, um, that I'm you know, sorry, doing something that I don't know anything about, which is a dilettante. So I think that we need we, there are a lot of struggles, but um, my own feeling is that in, you know, we, in spite of those things, I think we have made a lot of progress. I showed you that we have made a lot of progress. So I think it's possible. Just requires a little bit of willingness, and, and I think that's why I'm hoping that I think that in spite of the fact that the Gulf is very wide, there are people in the middle too, and 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 they can be translators and help each other. Do you want to reflect very briefly on question two? Um, what should this audience yeah, take I think, home? Uh, how can, uh, okay, how can they I think learn that I, I, I think both? the main thing that I would suggest to them because I think this also uh, in the work that uh, in one of the papers that we published in 2015 on social ideology, in, and it resonates with some, one, one idea in your paper, which is that whatever you're doing, you know, management problem somewhere, you, you, um, you, you said you call it the narrative, mm -hmm. I call it the phenomenon, uh, that you start from there. You, in other words, as an engineer, I myself, you actually always start with a problem, that, that something that is happening that you are unable to understand fully, and in order to understand it, you need to frame it in the right way. And the framing of the problem, we, as a hydrologist, I will frame the problem as a hydrological problem. But clearly we've heard that the problem is not hydrological, it's social and political and all these things. So what we, what we need as managers, all of you who are doing PhDs in man, you know, that you frame the problem as, in, in as broad a way as possible, that you don't miss out something miss out an important element, if you miss that out, then you sort of come up with a solution which will lead to an unintended outcome in the, in the end anyway, because the important thing has been left out. So maybe that's yeah. where hydro-social research comes in. So I give the floor to you. For the first question. So collaboration, integration between the two um, fields. Um, I, th I think it, I think it's really good that you know hydrology is is moving more I in this direction because it, it makes total sense. I mean, I've seen you know recently a call for research um, on the effects of climate change on the Chilean Andes, which is a region I've worked, and the call is is just physical. They're just interested in rainfall patterns and things like that. But if you look at all those river basins where climate change will be felt, they're heavily modified with um, agriculture and mining and, and forest plantations and things like that. So, 
you know, just to kind of measure one set of um, factors and not look at what's happening on the ground, it makes no sense. So I think it's really good that, you know, hydrology is making that direction. And, and by the same token, I mean, it's very disappointing, you know, that some, you know, that some of your colleagues have such a negative attitude to, you know, not being proper science. And, you know, as any social scientist here will know, you know, we've, you know, had this kind of things for years, you know, you're not doing proper science, you know, doing interviews isn't a proper method and things like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's good that we've got champions um, like yourself, you know, trying to, you know, to, to promote change within, um, especially the harder, harder science disciplines. Um, as for kind of collaboration integration, I mean, on one level, obviously, there's a lot of overlap, you know, looking at, you know, water systems and societies um, and those kinds of things, in how they inter interrelate, how they change, how they develop. Um, some of those kind of negative feedback loops that, that you referred to. Um, so that's <coughs> obviously something in common, but I think on another level, you know, we are trying to do things that are quite different. As I see it, you're trying to understand the changing environment, you know, which is a physical environment with human influences. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand that too, but with more emphasis on the social structures Mm -hmm. and the kinds of societies we have today and why they're uneven and trying to challenge those mm -hmm. processes. So I've, I've looked at a couple of the papers that you had in your, not your long list of 30 titles, 30 out of 90 titles, but the ones, the ones before that. And my sense is that they are a bit more of a kind of a pragmatic problem solving um, approach, you know, trying to inform policy in useful ways. And as political ecologists, that's not necessarily what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, reframe um, issues, um, mm -hmm. produce new, new explanations, in particular around sort of social change that's linked to um, the environment and to water and to, you know, promote new discourses, you know, as a result of those insights. So I think there's kind of similarities, but also still quite fundamentally different objectives. Mm -hmm. And what should this, take, this audience take home from both your uh, proposals? Well, the master's students already know, because I, I said already in our little meeting. Um, you know, for water managers, so people like me with this kind of approach, you know, we're not recommending practical um, measures that, you know, you can adopt and implement and solve and solve your problems. And, you know, I'm often asked in the field in the various places where I work, well, yeah, you know, you know, I like your analysis, but what's the solution? You know, what's your solution to this? Which usually I don't have an answer. And so for water managers, it's about trying to at least give an idea that there are different ways of thinking about things and that thinking about things in a slightly different way might throw up understandings and insights that you might otherwise not notice. And this is the thing about not taking water for granted. I mean, if I'm a water manager and I want to solve um, drinking water problems, I might think, well, I'll just install a desalination plant. But then, you know, if my population doesn't want to drink desalinated water because they've heard it's dangerous, you know, whatever, you know, that doesn't necessarily solve, solve my problem. So it's about having a wider... Um, understanding of things and trying to appreciate some of the complexity of social dynamics around water. Thank you very much. Now I realise if you haven't been uh, looking at these kind of theories before, it's a lot to take in. I do think that, that both presenters made a really big effort to, to stick to the main lines of their 
ways of working. So I'm hoping that in the audience, maybe some people have also have formulated their own answers to these questions from having listened to the presentations and from now heard the speakers' answers to these questions. So you're going home mm -hmm. when you finish your studies. What, are you, what have you learned from these two approaches? How are you going to take this into your practice? Is there someone who would like to say something about it? You can also say, oh, I don't like one or I don't like the other. Mm -hmm. That's also fine. But maybe you can then explain why. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you say, oh, this is not useful or that's not useful. So can, can we have some reflection from the audience of how these two approaches might work for them? We have a box, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> box. We have a talking box. Talking box. <laughs> <laughs> is it dusty? Is that how it works? I you had to put it's questions it's in it. It's a microphone. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, I've seen a course many papers published for you. And I'm just trying to say that, of course, I'm an uh, engineer. <laughs> so I normally go <laughs> much more into the ideologist side. I mean, when the first presentation was a little bit difficult to understand actually for me and um, I regarding the first question of collaboration I feel that uh, maybe we have to do the next step of trying to reach out to other people and trying to to see if you can start working with uh, somebody from social science science <coughs> Uh, that's also what I'm trying to do here in IHC, for example, I try to maybe, I you know, try to write something about uh, what the problems with uh, a social scientist, for example, a, a lawyer, <laughs> so that's, mm -hmm. I really feel, I have that experience right now, so I'm trying to, to write something with a lawyer, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a huge challenge for me, <laughs> actually, yeah. that's one of the things that I, I realize, because normally I'm not used to that kind of language and everything. But I think we have to do that next step, trying to to improve collaboration in that regard. And yeah. Someone else. Thanks to both of you for your nice presentation. Um, I'm a PhD fellow from Water Governance Share Group. I like both of your presentations, but the thing that strikes me most is that equation, how you try to quantify environmental awareness mm -hmm. with a simple, to me, looks like a little bit Hebrew equation. <laughs> so I would like to know about both of your personal opinion on quantifying such an um, you know, intangible issue like environmental awareness with uh, mathematical numbers. You know, I'll <coughs> defer to Jessica first before answering that. <laughs> um, should we respond to those two? Yeah. So, um, to the engineer who's trying to work with lawyers and, and the like, um, I think one of the good things about socio-hydrology is that it is trying to move beyond that traditional interdisciplinary approach which we've had now for quite a long time where you know on a an endeavor project or something you have a hydrologist doing hydrology an anthropologist doing anthropology and trying to to mix those things so i think what's good about socio-hydrology is that you know they are really trying to integrate um you know social factors into um, the hydrology itself so i think i think that's good i think that's an advance um, on your question about the quantitative, I'm, I must say I didn't understand the equation <laughs> for, for awareness. I did look at it and I didn't understand any of them, um, not even the one that appeared to be more simple, the, the awareness <laughs> one. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, you know, as a social scientist, you know, I would never represent something like that because that's not my, my language, my, my, my tradition. Um, I, I, I said before, I had seen a couple of papers um, from, uh, on sociohydrology. And one of my thoughts about it is a lot of it is coming from a systems perspective, which is quite in line with, you know, um, mm -hmm. natural sciences like, like hydrology. And I think at least what some of these people are doing is not kind of questioning that systems um, approach. Um, because that's kind of what they know and what makes sense and what forms part of their tradition they're going with it and so then you end up with a sort of scenario well this is the systems approach that relies heavily on the modeling and quantification so how do we incorporate the social into that mm -hmm. so while that's a good approximation i mean there is a as, as you point out there is a difference there between you know, how a systems person would approach social factors and how, you know, a more qualitative social scientist, like a sociologist or, or an anthropologist maybe, you know, would, would approach the, the social science. So I think um, when you've got over the barriers that you've got over so far, I think sort of some thinking about how, you know, how to incorporate um, some of the social factors and maybe going beyond sort of social factors and processes um, to some of the other things that I've talked about, um, for example. Um, so power um, and discourse and framing and those kinds of things. Um, yeah. okay. So how, what, what does that equation mean? What's actually in it? <laughs> <laughs> And I've met the question that it raises I for me, the question that it raises particularly it for me, yeah. Yeah. is is can you represent the norms and the values, or is it more important to represent the range of norms and values, mm -hmm. and whose norms are more important than uh, than yeah. someone else's? Well, uh, okay, good. Thank, thanks for the question. Um, all, first thing I should say is before we can run, we have to walk. So we have to start somewhere. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Now, uh, the equation that I presented there did not come from a social theory. Somebody, you know, somebody says this is the way people behave and therefore we arrive at an equation from it. It's just an intuitive, okay, it must be this. So it comes from intuition. Our intuition may be wrong and we were, our intuition was not informed by social theory. Number one. Um, so I just give you an example. I mean, you are asked why did you choose it? I give you a different example. Um, Giuliano Di Baldassare, who was used to be here, mm -hmm. uh, he modeled the coupled human flood system. Um, that's that is his research, and in, in his model also there is a social variable. It's called memory, memory of a flood. So think of think of a bank account. You have a bank account. So every time there is a flood. <coughs> you put money in the bank, okay? So there are more floods, money goes into the bank because that's a memory. There's a memory of the flood, goes into the bank. But then you have a few years of no, no flood, the memory depletes because you forget, okay? So that's a simple example of, so that's how we modeled it. So like a memory bank, okay? So. Floods happen more and more, and you your bank account goes up, and then floods don't happen for a few years. You forget, and you forget means that you you know that your generation forgets, and you start building close to the river, and then there's a big flood comes, and then and suddenly you remember again, and then you go, go again. So that is an example of the intuition that went into this environmental awareness. Also, number one, later we actually improved on that, based on some socio-ecological systems theory. The later papers that we published, we call it community sensitivity. Now, the answer to your question, so it, these things were not fully informed by social theory. We are still le trying to learn. Hopefully, social scientists in the audience can help us, you know, can help us with the theories. But recently, there was a paper published, this year actually, by people not related to us in Melbourne, Australia. They actually published a, pap a paper on the same thing, values, based on newspaper articles for 150 years. Environmental awareness. They published a paper, they were informed by our paper, but they didn't want to cite us. 
So they published a paper, 150 years of, of uh, you know, how people responded to environment. <coughs> and we were really upset. So we just recently submitted a paper to Hess explaining that what they discovered based on newspaper articles about people's attitudes to the environment was it exactly mirrored what we put in this model, environmental sensitivity. So we were able to show that what we modeled matches what was observed by newspaper articles independently. So how did they make the newspaper articles numerical? How did they give a number uh, to uh, it? Uh, I don't remember I now, but that's, uh, that that's is, they did. That they, is the main yeah, problem Yeah, they had maybe num into. numbers, account, I mean, I don't remember the detail, but they, this is New South, New South Wales newspapers for 150 years. So you can, it appeared in Global Environmental Change. Mm. So it's a prestigious journal. They published this, and we were really upset, but when we, we just submitted a paper comparing the, their results with our results, showing that, my God, we got it right. <laughs> so, so our intuition was right, at least, I, I, I mean, but I think we are still calling for social theory to inform us, help us better mm. model these things. I'm aware that our precious time is running out fast, but I think we have the opportunity for at least one, if not two more, interventions from the audience. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, I have uh, more of a question. Uh, you have uh, discussed about how both fields are similar but the objective is kind of different for each. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as an engineer I understand uh, how social aspects can be brought into the more analytical parts. But I is, I'm still not clear and I'm curious to know how uh, hydrological aspects are brought to the domain of uh, pure social mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. So that would be my question. Okay. Can I, like, my, like, uh, sort of comment is related, so... Yeah, can you wait for the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Tatiana, um, and I am a staff member here. Uh, I am trained originally as an anthropologist, uh, and yeah. now uh, I like to think of myself as a human geographer. Um, and I have, it's a silly anecdote. So like the first week that I started working here, I went outside, uh, there's a bar, and I was grabbing a beer, and then there was four fellow Latin American uh, male staff members on PhDs, and they asked me what did I do. Mm -hmm. So I told them that I was very happy, I had been hired, and I, that I studied the intersection of water and electricity in, in the Colombian Caribbean, uh, with stories of exclusion, race, legacies of uh, yeah, racism, and, and, and the war in the context of, of, yeah, of urban growth. And, and they told me, we, we do that too, but plus we also model, mm -hmm. uh, we also make like lot, and they start naming a lot of other things that they do, that they did. Uh, but yeah, we also incorporate that in our, in our models. And uh, at the moment I didn't reply, but then with time I have realized what struck me about the comment and is that we don't do the same, like the, the goal is different and uh, that is perhaps what sometimes is debatable like between the two, like oh now we do the same too, we, we also incorporate that in our models through uh, numbers and uh, how is the word, operationalization mm -hmm. of variables mm -hmm. and so we, we do incorporate all that uh, through intuition for example through uh, common sense, through, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. because we know what how every country works, or yeah. so that would be like my yeah my my, my comment on, on on both ways of doing things and how the social is very broad, um, and uh, and I like what Jessica said it's not perhaps the same goal like fixing although yeah the point is to change situations that we think are unfair. But uh, not through that, through like finding quick solutions or, or it's different. It's a different way of incorporating the social 
uh, or, or thinking about it. So I think both speakers can just briefly ref um, respond to these two comments. And your comment was more to Jessica, how can you incorporate the material or how do you do that? And then we heard Tatiana's reflection. So a lot of social scientists working on water don't incorporate um, the hydrology really at all in, in, in what they do or if they incorporate it to some extent, so um, some kind of hydrological data, for example, usually they accept that as given mm -hmm. and you know, use that as kind of the context um, of their work. Um, I, in my own work, have engaged a bit more um, in the hydrology element um, through essentially a critical analysis um, of hydrology in terms of how it approaches um, studying those physical processes, which is what I presented at the beginning of my talk, you know, how it kind of excludes the um, <coughs> social elements. And I've also looked at it in terms of the politics of um, using hydrological assessments to determine water allocation. So um, in the context, mainly Latin America, where I've worked, um, you know, hard science is privileged over other types of assessment, even for quite social situations like water allocation. Um, so I sort of interrogated a little bit that, that view um, that allocation had to be done by a hydrological model. I looked at how the hydrological model was done. Um, with the help of an engineer who could read equations, <laughs> I should point out. A lot of help, I should also add. And what looked to me to be a professional, thorough study was um, actually a mess. It used lots of data with um, huge limitations. And it also um, reinforced social exclusion from water by not looking at the context um, within which water was, was allocated where in which there was hoarding by um, a number of powerful farmers in this case so it actually kind of exacerbated that by sort of looking at that as a neutral situation just looking at how much water was there how much could be allocated and through the particular system that was in place ended up allocating what was left after the hoarding um, to, to the larger farmers as well. So you know, there's, there's two points there that hydrological studies are not always um, as accurate as they may look, um, that there's a big politics to defaulting to um, a, you know, a physical study, um, even where you've got a, a, a context of, sort of social allocation. Um, and also the way in which going straight for that kind of desocialized um, assessment can actually, you know, reinforce e exclusion. Final words to you? Yeah, maybe I'll answer uh, Tatiana's question. Uh, two, two points. One is, um, even though we dabble in social science, whatever, in, in the work that I do, we, we, we're not trying to co-opt social, social science and become social scientists ourselves. That is not what we're trying to do. I mean, if you ask me honestly, I'm trying to be a better hydrologist. That is my goal. I don't want to become a social scientist. I never wanted to be an ecologist because the social scientists know more social science than me. So I, I don't want to do that. I think what, what we are trying to do is become better hydrologists. So um, that's number one. Number two, um, yeah, Rome was not made in one day, and uh, and um, so even science, you know, you don't answer answer all, all the questions in one step. That's, that scientific method is actually you you have a problem, you have a hypothesis, you know, a phenomenon that you're trying to understand. You come up with a hypothesis, you formulate the hypothesis, build a, in my field, you build a model on the basis of the hypothesis, make a prediction, falsify it, test it against data and if it doesn't work you throw it out or you refine it 
So the way that we, the science works is step by step, learning along the way. This is what we will do. So you know, nothing, none of that. I mean, you said social science is very broad. Absolutely. You know, and 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 so my answer to that is one: I'm not trying to be a social scientist. So address all the social sciences problems related to water. I'm trying to help hydrology, you know, do better hydrology. Number one, and do it step by step, learn along the way, and and build up to the, the whole thing. And so, this is uh, what we are doing. And and so long as we are not, you know, crucified for this, we can still make progress. We can make a lot of progress. So I think uh, you, somebody may ask the question about, yeah, the modeling about, we, you know, in the Florida example, we actually model power dynamics too. We modeled it. We connected those values to the power, the relative power, and modeled it. So this is the way that we operate. So you know that was, I mean, I, I, the idea of power dynamics for Florida came from Giuliano. Actually, he, he listened to our presentation. Oh, that's power dynamics going on because he, he heard it from somewhere else. And he said, yeah. So you know, so so I think that there, there's progress that we can make step by step and and enrich our own fields. You know, our field, my field, can be benefit from. Working with social scientists, and and presumably social scientists working with water can also benefit from, mm. you know, learning, you know, bringing hydrological concepts into this. And for example, like you know, when Marguerite was there in in in, in uh, Annapolis a few weeks ago, you know, I made the comment that a lot of people, social ecological systems people, when they deal with water, they deal with wa water that is stagnant. <laughs> you know, they call it out it's hydrology, but hydrology is involves moving water, flowing water. It has additional um, aspect, richness to it, moving water. So water doesn't stay in one place, it moves along. So if you want to claim that you are doing social ecology system with, source, with hydrology, you want to have moving water. So that's, an, that's a lesson that, that social scientists can le better learn from hydrology. Water moves. <laughs> that, has, that has ramifications, upstream, downstream. Upstream, downstream, and, and, and so all these ramifications. So that you can learn. And you know, the California situation, you know, this is a beautiful story. The California went through a drought. It's, they claim that it's finished. Um, during the drought, five years, six years, heavy drought, the, the, the reservoirs all went down, the reservoir water level, surface water went down. The governor imposed the, uh, water, you know, restriction, water restrictions. People were penalized. For using water for to, to water the lawns and so on. During that drought, the farmers they were using they were irrigating wheat, but the price of almonds and uh, other things were sky high outside the world. They started irrigating throughout the year, not through the three months of the year, irrigating almonds. I have a beautiful picture of flooded uh -huh. almond plantation, flooded. You pumping groundwater, so groundwater is already depleted. But they went ahead and pumped groundwater during a drought to produce almond to, for the export market. Yeah. Which so, is a good example of water flowing through money. Water flowing through money, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and some of my colleagues are actually modeling that, studying that, because that's an example of something that uh, we hydrologists never studied this, we studied before. Now, for us, it's a beautiful problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much. On these very inspiring works. I think we heard enough possibilities for collaboration and exchange. Also, she likes your help to understand the hydrological models. Thank you. <laughs> you like her help to understand power relations right. and decision making. Right. So How to model it. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Tiny steps, as you yeah, say. That's right. We're looking for, forward to even better Mutual understanding. In the I think this is the audience, This is the place that it has to happen, because I don't. I haven't. I don't know of any other place in the world, uh, any other university in, institution in the world, where these two co communities can come together in one place. <laughs> I don't know of any other place. I'm sorry for overrunning a bit, but you were all very attentive, so I thought I could afford a few more minutes. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>
uh, largest challenges that humanity is facing. And well, I like, thanks a lot to uh, Jessica Waltz for coming and also to, to Mr. Sivapalan. It was amazing to have you here. Uh, it's just like I'm really uh, flabbergasted. And uh, well, I'll just, I'll, we want to thank you. And this is a small token of appreciation for, for coming. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, uh, there's like some complimentary, complimentary drinks after the, the, the talking, so uh, you're more than welcome to, to come and hang out and have a, a more <coughs> informal discussion with uh, these amazing speakers. So, well, thanks a lot. Why, why will you be uh, here? Yeah, in the canteen, of course, yeah. No, 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 it's not